last question I wanted to ask you was, did Chazal understand quantum mechanics? Yeah, so so that um, is, is a bit of a, a different subject in its own right, but it's kind of a fun one uh, to touch on. And I think it, um, you know, it connects a bunch of different themes of what we've been discussing, because I, I think the point is, for me, I always found the study of Torah the most enriching when I approached it with the humility of saying, this comes to me from Borei Olam, the creator of the world. He understands everything that I know or could know and more. And so I'm not going to say whatever produced this text that I'm studying uh, may have been sort of missing some information. Um, and then when I, when I uh, approach it in that way, it'll, it sensitizes you in a way to realize in many cases that it understands much more than people typically attribute to it. Um, and I think that that's especially true when you're reading Chumash, like the five books of Moses or, or Tanakh. Um, but I think you can, you can take a similar kind of attitude uh, to the Talmudic sages uh, and, and, and say that the, the Ruach Kodesh, the sort of prophetic inspiration um, that, that fired the, the statements that they made, it, it comes to us in an, often a very cryptic way or in a poetic way. But when we approach it in the right way, uh, we start to see that it contains many understandings and even some that are kind of shocking um, once we realize that they're there. Uh, and we just have to have the humility to be willing to look in the right way to find them. Now, all of that with that preface being said, I'm not saying, oh, you know, the if you just sort of turn the Talmud upside down, then you can find on page 493 like a a uh, hidden message that's exactly the same thing as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I, I don't think that that is remotely true. And I think we, when, when people engage in that kind of digging um, and, and try to say it all very neatly squares, like it actually fully agrees with everything that scientists say, um, I, I think that that's misguided and it, it plants its feet in the wrong place because usually when people are engaging in that activity, it's because they have a fundamental unease uh, about the Torah that they're looking to be uh, assuaged or sort of allayed by finding more proof that it's correct by the standards of science or something like that. And it, it, it's, it's not actually proof anyway. Scientists, when they hear these kinds of arguments, always are, are not persuaded by them because it, it's very pseudoscientific and mushy and doesn't actually work as an argument. Um, so we're not going to prove that the Torah is correct or prove that Chazal were correct about anything by trying to secretly find the mass of the electron in something someone was saying or whatever. However, I think that specifically with respect to quantum mechanics, there's an important point to be made about, again, kind of the philosophy of science. Like some of this is, is stuff that even scientists should be taught with, you know, that it doesn't have to have to do with Torah per se, even if they want to do their job better. Um, I, I wish quantum mechanics were more often taught this way. There is a, a sales job in the usual way that quantum mechanics is taught, even like, you know, in top universities to future great scientists or whatever, where there's such a, a fascination with the, the, the magic and the mystery of quantum theory when you formulate it in a certain mathematical way um, that I would say the, the real philosophical foundations of it are almost deliberately hidden from students. And what do I mean by this? What, what I mean is that the way that quantum theory is usually presented is that we had classical physics and in classical physics, things were normal. And what that means is when you measure things about the world, you, you take your measuring device, you just use it to tell you the number that is true about that piece of the world that you wanted to know. And it doesn't affect the thing that you measure. Uh, and it doesn't matter what you chose to measure uh, you know, it, that, that'll work equally well. And to the degree that our measurements come out differently one time to the next, it's because we don't have perfect measuring devices, but if we somehow did, then, you know, things would work better and all, all these things like that. Um, and then when you get to quantum theory, suddenly things get very spooky and weird where if you measure something here, it can affect something over there on paper, at least, um, and in ways that maybe, you know, also can be reflected in some other measurements you make, um, or, uh, that 
depending on what you choose to measure, you either can have a very determined result or a very indeterminate result where it's more of a probabilistic thing, et cetera. And the way that this is presented is that it's like a unique aspect of quantum mechanics that gets you this and um, that there, quantum theory um, requires new deep philosophical contemplations because we don't really understand all the spookiness of it. Um, and I used to be totally in the tank for this view of things. Like when I was a kid and I was growing up as a scientist, I loved reading about, you know, sort of uh, reading about physics as written about for popular audiences by, by physicists, people like Roger Penrose, you know, who's a brilliant guy and wrote some very interesting books that helped inspire me about physics also is extremely philosophically confused in my opinion and says a lot of things that are rank nonsense once it comes to sort of talking about uh, implications uh, for physics or mathematics uh, outside of the, the domain of science. This gets back to what we said before about subjective experience and you know trying to make science out of that. But, but in any case, um, that the, the, the way that this is taught, you know, it has this kind of magical quality to it, but I, you really have to actually run it in the other direction, even, you know, without talking in terms of how, how, how the Torah views this to begin with. Just look at classical physics and say, why would someone assert that because you've measured, uh, that, uh, sorry, that, that even if you haven't measured something about the world, that there is still a number that's true about it before you've measured it. Why is that a defensible philosophical position even before we have quantum mechanics? Like with quantum mechanics, that's forced on us. But even if you're talking about cannonballs or something, um, you shoot a cannonball like behind a screen so no one's looking at it up in the air and it goes up and it, and it goes down. The way we think about classical physics is that there is always a number which is true, which is the height of a cannonball off the ground the whole way through. But we just happen to have not measured it. And so the numbers are true about the world and they're sort of in this perfected numerical representation of the world that is the true reality, because this is how physicists like to talk about the world. Um, in this perfected number world, those numbers are true. And then when we like pull back the screen or when we take out our measuring device, we get to learn more of those true numbers about the world. That is a very mystical way of understanding what physics is doing. Like Wittgenstein, for example, would laugh at that way of understanding what physics is doing. Because what he would say actually is that measurement is a language game where we walk up to something with a stick that has notches on it and we call out the number that we think corresponds to the thing that you know uh, coheres with our presentation of that thing next to the stick. And so measurement is always actually a choice that we make to talk about numbers that seem to us to cohere with things that we choose to observe by certain procedures in the world. And I think that you could argue that that's really a very defensible and coherent way of teaching people about all of what science is and what measurement is, that measurements are not magically true numbers about the world that we didn't know yet and that we used a magical device to reveal to us with imperfect accuracy, but rather that measurements are human creations, the same way scientific theories are human creations, that all of this is ways we talk to each other about things we observe and things we find predictable. And once you, once you realize that's what's happening, then classical physics already had all the same spooky properties of, of quantum mechanics. And really the whole world um, has those properties. Because let, let's not talk about the mathematics of the, the uncertainty principle, all the wave function and boundary conditions, all these things that are specific to quantum theory. Talk in more general terms. If I just said to you about the world, do you agree it's true about the world that in general you find it's only partly predictable? You'd say yes. And you say, do you agree about the world um, that it is typically the case that in order to measure something, you have to be specific about the procedure by which you're going to measure it? And that it can be the case that the implementation of that procedure to measure one thing can impact your ability to measure another thing. You'd say, oh yeah, I think that that also tends to be true. Like for example, if you put a camera on the wall and try to observe people, they'll behave differently because they know the camera's there. But when, when you say that someone's like, what does that have to do with quantum mechanics? It has nothing. Of course it, it doesn't have anything to do with quantum mechanics. I'm not saying like because of quantum effects that the camera is, is, is observing them and it's changing their behavior. It's obviously a psychological phenomenon in that case. But it's nonetheless true that 
as you know, as a rule of thumb about the world, that's that's true in that setting also that observing things can change that the result of the measurement. Um, what's also true is that in order to measure something properly or predict the behavior of something properly, you often need to clearly define the whole system in which you're trying to do your experiment, right? Like you can't uh, say, I don't care what else is going on around me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna try to exert control over a whole domain. I'm just gonna focus on this one part that I'm trying to, to, to zoom in on and make sense of. That doesn't work if you're in the middle of a, a field with stampeding bulls in it or something because it will disrupt your ability to, to focus on what you wanna focus on. And again, that's not quantum mechanics, but it is true that really in order to make measurements carefully, you need to control a whole domain. You can't just focus on the part of that domain that you're supposedly measuring. You need to exert control over a broader domain that you regulate. Uh, and that's part of, part of the, the, the setting in which you're gonna make that measurement. All of those things are things that physicists got into the philosophically mistaken view because of the mistakes they made from the success of classical physics, where they said, wow, the world is just a mechanism of behaving according to simple rules. And all the unpredictability is actually coming from the fact that the rules have somewhat difficult to predict implications. But if we can just isolate a tiny enough piece of the world so that we don't have all of these kind of complex outcomes, then we can render certain tiny pieces of the world perfectly predictable. We can uh, you know, create a situation where there are only a few things that can be measured about this thing and they can be measured perfectly and they can be known perfectly um, and, or to arbitrary precision. Um, and that will be independent of the procedure that we devise. Like that in a sense was the hope when people started breaking the world into tinier and tinier and tinier pieces. And then what happened was that quantum theory and its requirements jumped up and sort of bit them and, and said, no, all of these things that were true anyway about the world, they're actually fundamental things about the world. They can't be eliminated because you thought that the partial unpredictability in the world was just a contingency that derived from the fact that you didn't don't know enough of the initial conditions of all the different pieces that you were dealing with, or you hadn't perfectly measured something, et cetera, et cetera. Or um, uh, you thought that uh, you hadn't, you didn't have the ability to measure everything at the same time because of things like psychology, but little tiny particles don't have psychology. So if you can just get one little tiny particle by itself, you can measure everything and you'll be done. And that turned out not to be the case. And so quantum theory, or let's say the, the rules of quantum mechanics, as we have discovered them, you could say are Akados Baruch's way of, in, of ensuring <laughs> that all of these more general statements remain the case, even for the tiniest little broken off bits of matter that you try to isolate, that you need to actually talk about the shape of the whole system and define your domain because the wave function actually cares about the boundary conditions and you can't solve the Schrodinger equation without defining boundary conditions for it. Um, you, you need to actually define your measurement procedure because different things that you measure will affect your ability to measure other things uh, because of things like the uncertainty principle or because of um, uh, things that, that have to do with how two different observables in general may be intertwined. Um, and, and you need also to accept that there are some situations in which what you've chosen to measure will have an unpredictable outcome. And now, and now it looks much more intrinsic and, and, and through the lens of quantum theory. But the point is that it never stopped being the case with quantum mechanics that whether with Newton's laws and classical mechanics or with quantum mechanics, they're both theories on paper that make a mathematical representation of the world on paper. And that helps us to make predictions about the measurements that we make in the world. But what's happening on paper with like the equations and stuff, that's never the same thing as the world itself. Uh, and that is a, a big philosophical mistake. I think many theoretical scientists especially fall into where they, they fail to recognize the distinction between their theories of the world and the world itself. Um, and the, so I, I think like the two final statements to make on this are, first of all, that um, that mistake in a sense is the essence of idolatry because it's saying something of your own construction is a totalizing substitute for the world itself, like that you've made something that fully 
you know, it's it's Masea de Adam, right? It's a, a, a human construction that substitutes for the full-blown reality of Masea Bereshit that was made by the hand of Hashem. Um, and, and, and you're, sir, you're, you're, you're doing a very rarefied and fancy and, and mathematically sophisticated version of what Yeshayahu decries, where you sort of, you know, make the fire to cook your food with one half of the wood and, and carve something to tell you what the world is um, with the other part. Um, so I, I think that is a, a, a way that Torah really illuminates your understanding of what science is and what its limitations are um, in, in a valuable way, even to doing science better and making more sense of it. I think in principle, you could think more carefully about quantum mechanics as a result of something like this, even if that were mostly your goal. And the other thing I would say is like going back to the way the question was posed at the beginning, that there are many things in Chazal, uh, in, in, in the, the, the Talmud, in the statements of the sages, that reveal that they have this philosophical understanding, right? That they basically, uh, they know that the world is only partly predictable. They know that the way you choose to measure things affects what you measure and what you can measure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and there are numerous examples of, of, of instances where something that they're talking about you suddenly realize sounds a lot like uh, a, a philosophical problem that we usually identify as being part of uh, the, the mystery of quantum theory, but that they're treating it with great comfort because they understand from the standpoint of halakha, from the standpoint of Jewish law, that these are all t tools in their hands, that, that the methodology is to find ways of talking about the world that are effective in characterizing what's happening. And so of course it can be the case that if you observe something over here, that it can affect the state of something over there. Like if you uh, slaughter a cow and you observe <clears throat> that there's a defect in its inner organs, then that can invalidate the kashrut of meat that was taken from the cow. And they're not in the same place. Um, like halacha, so to speak, can move at the speed of light, just like quantum entanglement. But from when we say that about halacha, it's much more obvious. It's like, well, but that's because you created a legalistic framework such that the definitions and states of things are affected this way. Um, but that doesn't mean um, that that's different, actually, than what quantum theorists are doing. The whole mistake is that they're, they're pretending they're doing something else than that. And I think also the fact that, you know, even theologically, our our understanding of the uh, principle of God's unity um, and a separate nature from the world, his his uh, transcendence, I think that has allowed the Jewish people to kind of understand things from a holistic point of view, like a, a the unified field theory, right? That where everything understanding the interconnectedness in nature and not just seeing everything um, from, you know, as its own kind of uh, things. Like, for example, Abu Dazara, like you mentioned, you can fall into the trap of believing that that is the ultimate reality. And if you, if you, you have to kind of take yourself out of that perspective and to see things in a bigger picture in order to fully understand what you're looking at, what you're dealing with. So I think the way you, the way you kind of tied it all together was absolutely brilliant. And uh, thank you so much for making the time. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed this discussion. Um, we got to cover a lot, a lot of, a lot of different things, uh, yeah. and uh, it's it's been really interesting. Yes, and I hope to do it again. And I hope to do one one episode on textual. Uh, you know, like you you kind of do that with Machon Shilo, which I really appreciate when you go into the text. And we would love to just do one episode with you, hopefully with my co-host next time. He wasn't able to make it. So thank you again for joining and uh, hope to see you soon. My pleasure. Take care. Take care.